Oh, hi, Chris. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It was very informative. Um, I just had one question. You said you're not really too concerned about electricity, but couldn't also the same thing be said about uranium, the depletion of uranium? All the Cold War uranium st uh, stockpiles have been going down the last years, and uh, since you know atomic energy is one of the most efficient ways uh, to produce electricity, all the good grade uranium um, nowadays is depleting. So couldn't the same thing say about uh, electricity costs going up uh, tremendously over the next few years? Yeah, most electricity is produced by burning coal at this point. Um, China did something really remarkable. From 2000 to 2010, they doubled their total energy production, of which electricity was the major component. That means they were growing their electricity at about 7% per year. Startling growth. So China now consumes half the world's coal for both steel uh, making and also for electricity production. Half. And China has 36 uh, nuclear plants on the drawing board, and we know about, and, and I've uh, had conversations with people who are in the uranium business, and they say China is busily out there trying to lock up 40-year-long contracts for the lifespan of these, of these reactors, um, for all these reactors. And they're having difficulty just trying to figure out how to meet the demand for these 36 reactors, from known mines, from, from existing output, from all of that, because you're exactly right. About a third of all uranium that's burning right now in nuclear plants got there because of decommissioned warheads. We've been at a deficit for actual uranium production for a while. There are a lot of mines coming online. They take a long time. There's huge permitting processes, and, and it's, it's very difficult to do it safely. And so it take, just takes time. And, and so there is a huge story of depletion where uranium ore grades are declining uh, very, very steadily. And even meeting current plants that are either on the drawing board or already functioning, we can look at total world production and go, oops, there's, there's some difficulties there. Will we be able to, um, right now there's maybe 440 operating nuclear reactors in the world. If we want to start using nuclear instead of oil, we might have to bring that up to say three or 4,000 reactors um, pretty rapidly and uh, use the electricity instead. So there's an incredible story there and, and I truly believe that, that uranium, as we currently use it, um, is absolutely part of the solution but it, it'll, it won't be more than, than a, a smallish part. And uh, for anybody who's interested in investing that, that around these ideas, that's a story that, that has, uh, is really worth your time to look into. Okay. Um, sorry, um, what do you think about um, shale gas? Could it help to postpone uh, the collapse of the system? Or, because the development of, in shale gas is quite... Uh, yes, yeah, shale gas is, is a, a very interesting story. Um, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Arthur Berman who's actually done something. There, there's the, the oldest shale gas play that we have is the Barnett play in Texas, um, in Louisiana. And, and that play has about 500,000 holes drilled into it so far. So we have pretty good data on it. Um, and what he discovered was that when you really look at it on a well-by-well -well basis, you find out it's not this big, giant place where every well is a great producer. There's hot spots. And we found them by braille, if you will, by sticking all these holes in the ground. And some of these wells really have magnificent payouts. And some of them actually will never pay out on an energy return basis. And they deplete a lot faster than, than is currently claimed by the industry. New York Times just had a report where the SEC is looking into the claims that have been made. And guess what? They were a little bit hyped because we were taking the shale gas companies at their word for, for what was going to be produced there. So I don't think there's quite as much as been you know, popularized. There's maybe just a little bit less, and there's some wrinkles in that story. Um, but we could use shale gas absolutely as a bridge fuel uh, in many locations that I, I think would be, would be absolutely the ideal choice. Uh, in that story, we're going to have to do a huge infrastructure build out from the pipelines, as I mentioned, the filling stations, uh, retro uh, converting cars, building new, new vehicles and fleet that, that can operate on compressed natural gas. It is an incredible fuel. It's not quite as much as we thought. And when you hear things like 100 years of shale gas, there's always an asterisk on that that they never mention. And at the bottom it says, at current rates of consumption. So if we suddenly say we're going to start using a huge amount of this natural gas instead of for um, load generation for electricity production in some manufacturing processes, but also for transportation in whole percentage terms, you can take that 100 years and just start dividing it by other numbers. There might be decades left. There might be years left. There might be <coughs> several decades. It's hard to know. But we, won't, we don't really use any of our natural gas at this point in practical percentage terms for transportation yet. And when we do, we'll find we're going to burn through it a lot faster. So I would promote using that natural gas to figure out not how to sustain our current transportation infrastructure as it currently exists, but to use that investment to reconfigure our transportation system, to operate on something other than uh, the fuels that we're currently using. Thank you, Mr. Masterson. 
Um, I have understood one thing. In this, in this, crossing, in this exponentially crossing world, I, I can imagine that pe real people will have the opportunity to create new, new ways of relations. And ahead, ahead of my personal interests on gold, on preserving my purchasing power, which do you think would be the, the role for gold or for silver? As we, in this moment, can understand the value and the meaning of these metals. That already you've said that in the next 20 years we'll lose knowledge about how many, <laughs> how many gold will, will remain in the, into the planet Earth. No, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm a big, uh, so um, just to, to put all my cards on the table, 75% of my total net worth is in gold and silver right now, physical. Um, it started at 50-50 and then it kept growing because gold and silver went up and I couldn't find anything else I wanted to put my money in, so it just grew. Um, and the, I treat those as separate metals, so it's not one word for me, gold and silver. Um, gold is a monetary asset. I love it because of its monetary role. It performs beautifully in periods of negative real interest rates, of fiscal irresponsibility, which a 10% deficit to GDP is fiscally irresponsible during monetary madness. Those are all, and, and, and financial system instability or the threat of it, those are all perfect tailwinds for gold. And I also love it because it has that option value of what happens if gold ever gets remonetized. Um, you know, as James Turch said, there, there's uh, obviously a lot of upside if gold does get remonetized. So, so I love gold for its monetary role. Um, silver, I don't think, is, is, has as much of a shot of being remonetized, but it's a gorgeous industrial metal. It's used for things that we know of no substitutes. It is the most reflective metal known, element known. Uh, it's the most conductive. Uh, it's used in certain applications for which we have no idea how we would replace it. It's got growing uses as an antimicrobial in healthcare applications. It's fantastic. So silver is the thing that I don't have grandkids, but if I do someday, that's kind of the, my, the, what I plan to pass on to them. I'm looking at silver as a 10 or 20 year play, a Rip Van Winkle um, sort of a, an a investment for me because I'm convinced we will get through a, a pretty rough patch reconfiguring ourselves. We will continue to operate industrially. Silver will always have a role. And as well, I can see the depletion story. And I have this other view which says that over the next 10 or 20 years, we will be digging fewer mile deep holes in the ground to get at 0.2% copper grades and silver is a byproduct of mining many of those base metals. Um, so I think we're going to be doing less of that. All told, I actually see silver as being a, a much more valuable metal than gold because of its utility in industrial processes. And it's actually a lot scarcer than people believe. That 16 to 17 to 1 ratio is, is the ratio of gold to silver in the crust as it naturally occurs. But if you took a snapshot right now and said, freeze, we're not taking any more gold or silver out of the ground, which is rarer? It's a toss up. There might be about as much gold as silver on the surface of the planet right now on an ounce for ounce basis. So silver's reduced value in part is predicated on the idea that we're going to constantly forever be pulling more out of the crust of the earth. And that's, that, might, that might happen. I don't think it's true. Um, and so that's part of my investment philosophy around silver. It's a very scarce, depleting mineral and something that I think will grow only more scarce and has got incredible utility. Um, and, and it's really shiny and I like how it looks. <laughs> Please, sir. Um, thank you, Chris, for um, what's a very um, insightful presentation. Um, in the spirit of no question being a stupid question, do you have any views on uh, the Tesla coil as an alter alternative source of energy? Um, uh, did you, uh, do you have any views on that? Yeah, I, I have a, there's always, every year there's, there's um, I get these uh, emails a lot. Every year there's somebody who's come along who's somehow violated the second law of thermodynamics. We're going to get energy for nothing. Um, whether it's, it was a super magnet thing, there was some company in Ireland two years ago, and, and there's always something coming along. And I have this view that says um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. And so it's insufficient for me for any one inventor to come along and, and set up a demonstration and say, look, I need to see that independently verified and replicated. And I haven't seen anybody independently verify or replicate um, going past unity, meaning we put one unit of energy into a Tesla coil and we get more than one unit back out in some usable fashion. Um, that's also true of this low energy nuclear reactor, the, the Rossi device. Uh, I still need to see that independently verified, um, et cetera, and so forth. So I, even though if this were true, 
tonight, it turns out that some magic device is created and it creates endless amounts of heat or electricity. We still have to find a way to scale that up and get that distributed across the world in breakneck speed at the fastest pace of market adoption that's ever been seen. And so it would require real coordinated government action or official action or something, you know, an Apollo program times a, you know, a Manhattan Project times 10. It would take some real incredible act of coordination to get this brand new disruptive technology out fast enough to really make a difference. Um, so I, I have hope that something like that will come along, but I find hope alone is a terrible strategy uh, when it comes to investing and, and uh, making decisions. Please, sir. Hi. Uh, the United States is one of the richest uh, countries in the world uh, in terms of natural resources, yet it imports a lot of natural resources. China, it's uh, exporting less natural resources as, as we move forward. So do you think uh, China and the U.S. are already in this stage you're forecasting that are preserving their natural resources? Uh, it goes beyond that. China has, for the past 10 years, been on a very aggressive global program of acquiring resources, uh, either in Africa or in South America, Canada, you pick it. And they've got their magic checkbook out, and they're outbidding virtually everybody um, for key natural resources. And it doesn't even matter if they make sense or not. Uh, uh, China recently, a, a, a Chinese company, outbid the next nearest competitor by over a billion dollars for the last great known um, copper deposit in the world. It's a valley, it's in Afghanistan, it's in a war-torn area, there's no road that goes to it yet, there's no way to get to it. They didn't care, they bought it. Um, and so this story we're seeing is that China has been acting as if resources are a real scarce commodity out there and growing increasingly scarce. You look at China's copper imports for the past three years, no possible way do they make sense given the amount of exports and the amount of industrial capacity they've got going on. They're clearly stockpiling. They've just started to build a national and, and are filling up a national petroleum reserve. And when we look at things like um, iron ore imports, they're importing far more than they need, mostly of things that you can store really easily and well. Um, and, and so that makes perfect sense in, in this story. We're also seeing, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, to cut to the chase, what I see is that there will be increasing friction between all sorts of superpowers around what resources remain. That's a story that I would expect to carry on as we go forward. Um, and I think that story is already afoot at this point in time. And China's acting as if uh, they get this and that they really want to be sure that they can secure access to resources. Um, they're using a checkbook diplomacy. The rest of the world seems to be using gunboat diplomacy at this point. It remains to be seen which is the better strategy. Um, but it's pretty clear that the race is on for global resources. Uh, the uh, interior minister of India, who's responsible for making sure India has enough oil to import, is, was out recently trying to lock up um, multi-decade contracts for oil and used the term, he said, I had to scour the globe and came up empty for what he was looking for. So by the time you have a country the size of India scouring and saying, whoops, you know, this didn't quite work out like we were hoping, it again tells you where we are in the story. There are no giant abundant surpluses, so we're already seeing that, that competition for dwindling resources. In part, this explains to me, the world's economy is not in great shape at this point. Oil is still over $100 a barrel on the world stage. That tells us something. So these are all just signs and signposts that suggest this isn't a story that will come in 10 years or 20 years. It's starting right now, and it's already in play. Sir? Chris, can you give us your view on palladium and platinum, please? Um, palladium and platinum, uh, both, really, I'm looking at those more as industrial metals at this point in terms of their overall value, um, mostly as catalysts. Uh, it, they're, they're, that's their primary use. Um, I still like them a lot. Uh, I think that we're going to discover that... that um, uh, the need for catalysts is, you know, beyond catalytic converters and cars, the need for catalysts is going to just grow if we try and make industrial processes more efficient. Um, we still don't know of, of catalysts that work better uh, in some cases than those two metals. So I, I do like them a lot, and they're, they're subject to the same depletion um, stories uh, that we see elsewhere. But if we dig further into the metal story, um, recently there was a, um, there's this company in Los Angeles that, that prints solar cells now, and I had somebody send me an article that said, that's it. Our, our problems are solved. They just print this stuff. It's like a giant HP <laughs> laser printer, and, and they just roll out just megawatts of this stuff. And I said, that's great. And it uses a gallium indium arsenide layer. And you know where we get gallium from? Two sources. One mine in Africa. The second source is we scrub the fly ash out of the stacks of coal plants, and we smelt it, and we get gallium from that. That's it. If you wanted to open up a gallium mine, where would you go? There is nowhere. We don't know of any other sources. So the idea that 
um, we could you know start printing off the, these these uh, uh, massive you know rolls of, of solar panels is limited by the fact that we don't know how to do that except with the stuff that there's not enough of to maybe supply one major city in the world. After that, this company has to retool their process around something else. And so when I look through the other metals that are out there, the indiums, the galliums, the, the um, uh, these are there's incredible wonderful stories that these are uh, in much rarer and, and much more uh, useful than, than most people understand um, it commonly. And so there, I think, again, there's just incredible stories around uh, what we uh, could, you know, from an investment standpoint, um, uh, it's just uh, startling. So I kind of put, but put um, both uh, the pl platinum and palladium into that story of, of, you know, how can we use them? How are they industrially useful? And, and how much is out there? And again, there's just a great story there for them. Muy bien, pues muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Chris. It was really interesting. <laughs>